Greetings, this video is going to be a response to certain Roman Catholic and even so-called Orthodox that have leveled some criticisms that they won't ever come on and debate publicly. All they do is sort of do these online teenage style responses, uh, but I don't see why people can't just argue face to face. I mean, it's what men do. First of all, I want to say that I, I was a Thomas for a long time. I can prove this. Here's my Summa. I've done a lot of my homework uh, in Thomas's Summa, so I am not making up the fact that uh, I was. I even delved deeply into the Summa Contra Gentiles. And on top of that, I want to add that uh, I've done my homework in Denzinger. I've read the entire Denzinger more than once. And this is because I was very serious as a Roman Catholic. Uh, I wanted, in fact, to go into monastic life for a period. And thank God I didn't. But for one, because of uh, many of the monastics, uh, uh, how should we put it? They're a little light in their loafers. So thank God for keeping me from all of that garbage. Uh, but we're also going to be talking about some other lesser known writings, maybe, that will uh, uh, impact this question of whether or not palamism can be reconciled with Thomism. And of course, because Thomism is so integral to the many centuries of the, uh, you know, post Renaissance Roman Catholic Church. Uh, there's this ecumenical push to try to meld the two. And of course, they're not meldable at all if one understands the debate, for example, between St. Gregory Palamas and Barlium. Barlium, even though he's open to criticism, he represents the, the, the Western tradition, the Neoplatonic, Augustinian style uh, philosophical presuppositions. And I think that what we want to stress, which has been stressed many times, and this is often misunderstood, is that Orthodox theology is not Hellenism. It may be using the terms of Greek philosophy like hypostasis, but hypostasis is used in the New Testament. So Orthodox theology is no more Hellenic than, than is the New Testament uh, or the Septuagint. So, and the other idea is that Hellenism can mean different things. It can mean a cultural statement or Hellenism could actually mean a lot of different philosophical heresies and errors. One of those heresies and errors is, of course, the Greek philosophical notions of being, uh, of, of Greek ideas of ontology, Greek ideas of divine simplicity, toon, or what being is. And for most of the Greeks, uh, this would be character characteristic of Aristotle and Plato, the Neoplatonists. The idea of what divine simplicity is, is that it's an absolute unity beyond being apiron, which is therefore unclassifiable you can't speak about it, it has no distinctions now when theology uses the the terminology of simplicity it's a little bit hairy because yes in a way we don't mind necessarily talking about god's divine nature being beyond being it is it's beyond classification via negativa everybody has some space for this idea in their theology. So that's really not even in question. That's not what the debate is. The debate rather centers around what when we talk about distinctions in God, such as persons, the Father being distinct from the Son, and the Father and the Son being distinct from the Spirit, uh, or when we talk about the divine actions, creating uh, divine, uh, divine foreknowledge, divine justice, divine mercy, or when we talk about uh, faculties like the divine will, Right? The question becomes, how real are these distinctions? Uh, are they only human logical distinctions that in actuality are act isomorphically identified and sort of smushed together into the divine essence? Uh, or are, are the distinctions real, metaphysically real? And this is the essence of what divides Eastern and Western theology. All of the other ideas like filioque, created grace, the different debates about created grace. I'm very familiar with Bonaventure's distinctions, John Scotus's distinctions versus the uh, more uh, uh, Thomistic ideas of what created grace means. I know there's debates on that, so you don't need to message me about what St. Bonaventure said about uh, created grace. I know what he said. 
it's the question really is what is the the nature of the distinctions in the system as a whole and what you start to see over time and this is what i finally figured out as a thomist which was not easy to accept i mean i was very devoted to this i was very enmeshed in thomism because i thought it was a very elegant system that worked very well uh, but what you start to realize is that there are numerous problems that result from the starting point of this doctrine of absolute divine simplicity. So let's start with that premise. Is Thomas's doctrine of divine simplicity actually different from Eastern theologians? Now, a lot of people will go to the Summa and they'll go to volume one and they'll try to mine out quotes, especially Roman Catholics. This is what I used to do. You try to mine out quotes that will sound similar. We're not interested in finding the quotes that sound similar to uh, Western or to, to to Eastern theologians to, for example, point out that God is one or that God has a, a divine has a simple essence. We all know that, and everybody believes that and agrees with that. However, if we look, for example, at Thomas's teaching, he actually has a work that is not generally translated into. Uh, English, however, it is included in the Penguin Classics version of Thomas Aquinas' selected writings. And let's see what he says. I've cited this in many articles. Uh, it's very, uh, it's abundantly clear. I don't know why people won't just be honest with this. But let's look at what he says. Notice here, on the contrary, and this is in the section where he's actually dealing with John of, da of Damascus's argument that the uh, energies of God are distinct from the essence of God. And he replies, on the contrary, Rabbi Moses says that God is not, I'm trying to make this clear here, God is not being by essence, nor living by life, nor powerful by power, nor wise by wisdom. Therefore, in God, essence is not other than his existence, right? So there, and this is in uh, explicit rejection of John Damascus's arguments for the essence energy distinction in book one of uh, on the Orthodox faith. So he clearly says, no, John, you're wrong about distinguishing the attributes or energies of God from the divine essence, precisely because it goes against the idea of, of divine simplicity. Who does he cite? Maimonides. <laughs> so, I mean, you can't get any clearer than that. Now, in I have other talks where I've dealt with this. I don't know why people can't just listen to those talks. And uh, in those talks, I actually list the sections in the Summa where Thomas makes it very clear that in in his in his theology, in his philosophy, there's absolutely no real distinction between divine mercy, divine foreknowledge, divine love, divine justice, divine act, and the divine essence. I mean, he says that numerous times. It shouldn't even be debatable. I, uh, these Catholic apologists that are trying to argue with me just sim simply haven't read this in the Summa. Go read your Summa. He makes it abundantly clear. There is no uniting of these two views because Aquinas specifically rejects the uniting of those two views. So if you're going to be a Thomist, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, okay, maybe you're going to reject Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> on divine simplicity but divine simplicity is what conditions this whole system and this is why later on uh, ideas like infused created grace which come from augustine out of on the trinity right the the, the substance that is infused uh, is cr a created substance in the council of trent you have this uh, uh, accepted as the norm uh, that that infused created grace uh, again it, is because of ultimately divine simplicity, right? Because the, the question is, well, what are we partaking of if we're not partaking of the divine essence, right? We can't partake of the divine essence because then we would become gods. So what are we partaking of? Well, we partake of a, a habit, uh, right, of sanctifying grace or whatever different terminologies that are used by Roman Catholics. What, none of this is, is right. None of this is correct. We don't partake of some infused created substance. We take partake of uh, the divine power itself. Jesus says in John 17 that he came to make us, his followers, partakers of the glory that he had with the Father before the foundation of the world. That's John 17. So now is the glory that God had before the foundation of the world created? No, it's not. Is the glory that we're partaking of uh, the divine essence? No, it's not. So there's no middle term here right, for the Thomas to accept, or the Augustinian, by the way. 
Um, now, so it, the, the response is always, well, but uh, Aquinas and Augustine talked about deification. They talk about partaking of the divine nature. Yeah, that's not what's in the debate. We're not debating whether they make correct statements at times. We're debating whether or not it's consistent. That's the point, right? We're not debating Thomas's intention. We're not debating Augustine's good, uh, well-intentioned purpose of talking about deification. What we're debating is whether the philosophy and the theology is biblical and accurate and historical, and it's not. That's the point. So let's look at a couple more points here that have been brought up uh, in <laughs> attempted response to me. Next, we want to look at the topic of, again, created grace here and infused righteousness. So, look, I have read On the Trinity. Here we go. This is On the Trinity, book 14, chapter 12. Yeah, 14.12 and then 14.15. And what we get is that in both of these sections, Augustine says that the righteousness that you get in justification is not the righteousness by which God is righteous. So if it's not the righteousness by which God is righteous, it's an infused created habit. Right? I don't know how clearer that could be. Now, why is that a big deal? Because that's the exact section that is cited in the Council of Trent to explain, here you are, here's your Denzinger, Denzinger 799. To explain what the charity and justice of God are that we get in justification. So, yes, the infused habit is created because it's not the righteousness that God himself has. And that is stated explicitly in on the Trinity here in this section. Right. Can, can you read? Are you able to look things up? Roman Catholics. Here you are. We are not getting God's righteousness. So if you're not getting God's righteousness because God's righteousness is his essence. This is stated hundreds of times by Aquinas and Augustine. What are you getting? I mean, there's, there's no other options with divine simplicity in this view. It's absolute. So what you're getting has to be an, a created, infused substance. I mean, how much clearer could it be? Another way that we know that, that Augustine was not saying that there's a participation in God himself, even though he's, again, inconsistent on this at different times, and that's why Roman Catholic theology would later go on to define exactly what it means by the infusion of justice and righteousness, is the manifestations of the theophanies. Augustine does view them as created holograms that are not God. Uh, this is explained at the end of Book 3, where he explicitly says that they are not God. The Old Testament theophanies are not God because God is the Trinity and the Trinity doesn't doesn't appear. And since the Trinity doesn't appear, then it's not God, right? And so, in other words, because of the divine simplicity, because it, it's absolutely outside time and space, limitation and so forth and so on, and because Augustine does think that person, act, will, etc. are all the same as the divine essence in a strict identification. He doesn't see how it's possible that one person of the Trinity could manifest within time and space. That's what he says. Um, and that's why he says, so what these had to be was just created angelic manifestations. They were wrought by angels, he says. Uh, he says again on the previous page, page 67, if you have the shaft set, that they were not God. Now, why is that? Well, he goes on uh, to discuss in the next few books, book seven, uh, about the relationships of God's essence to his actions and his persons. And for Augustine, all the operations of God are a strict identification with his essence. Uh, the Holy Spirit is the glue, therefore, between the Father and the Son. And it's these relations of oppositions that give the persons their their identity. Now, it is true that Augustine does have a place for the idea of the Father as the monarchia of the Trinity, uh, as the arche uh, of the principal uh, starting point, if you will, of the Trinity. Uh, but it doesn't really matter because the issue between the East and the West ultimately is not whether or not we can get Roman Catholics to admit 
that there's a principal place for the father. The difference ultimately in terms of the filioque, filioque which was, as we said, ultimately results from divine simplicity. And if you read on the Trinity, that becomes very clear. Uh, Augustine, you can see his reasoning why based on divine simplicity and why he begins, you know, these early chapters talking about the theophanies, uh, you know, you can see his train of logic. Now, I think it's wrong, but you can see why he says these things. So it's very frustrating for us to, for me, to have to explain Augustine to Roman Catholics themselves. Uh, I mean, you ought to know Augustine better than me. Well, maybe not. I don't know. I mean, I was into this for all of my 20s. I mean, I spent years reading thousands of pages of Augustine. As you can see, it's not made up. <laughs> so I know what he teaches. And... The, the, the point that we're trying to get across here again is that what distinguishes the East and the West, and we're going to see this in St. Gregory Palamas because it's by his time that the debates really become clear as to what the differences are. And again, for us, there's no such thing as Palamism. There's either Orthodox or, or not Orthodox. Uh, and so there's not, there's no, there's never going to be an ability to merge Roman Catholicism and Orthodoxy or Aquinas and Orthodoxy. And it doesn't matter how many theologians in Russia in the 1700s liked Aquinas. It really has nothing to do. That's irrelevant. It has nothing to do. And I've read Andrutsos and these different characters uh, who were very interested in borrowing uh, arguments and ideas from Aquinas. It doesn't matter that Aquinas uh, and certain Eastern fathers before him made arguments for, uh, made a cosmological argument. It doesn't matter that 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 they that there's a, a teleological argument that has nothing to do with the central points of disagreement. The central points of disagreement start with absolute divine simplicity and the attendant results of the distinctions between essence and energy or not, right? Whether there is a distinction or not. Now in Thomism, all of the Thomists for the most part, except for maybe modern liberal Thomists, all the Thomists are absolutely 100% clear. Go look it up on Catholic Encyclopedia. It's always been the case that the distinctions that are said about God are only logical. They're only human conceptual distinctions. They do not exist in reality. They're not real ontological metaphysical distinctions. So God creating is absolutely no distinct from the divine essence. God's foreknowledge is absolutely no distinct from God's mercy or God's love. Now, why is that? Well, again, the presupposition, as we saw from the work, right, on divine simplicity, is to guard against there being accidents in God, to guard against there being parts to God. Well, the first presupposition that's false here is the idea that distinction means parts, because every Roman Catholic will admit that the Father is truly and really distinct from the Son. Does that mean there's parts? No. So that that rebuttal doesn't work. Now, in the same way, we can speak of distinctions in God as real distinctions without there being parts in God in terms of his actions. And this is why it's absolutely unnecessary to say that God's essence is his act. Right? He's not He's not pure act with no potentiality. Now, why do we say that? If God is pure act with no potentiality, it obviously follows that creation was not a free action. And all the attempts by all these different Roman Catholics to try to answer and solve this problem, they completely fail precisely because all they do is restate the issue. They say, well, uh, that's about God uh, in terms of his inner Trinitarian life, uh, but it's not about God in terms of his exterior manifestation. Uh, and so therefore creation is a free action. No. Because you've already said that all the actions are the divine essence in complete isomorphic identification. And this is why St. Gregor Palamas, when he argues against Barleum, stresses over and over and over that these are the implications of your theology, especially when we get to things like generation or spiration. Okay, so this is the next important point in response to these uh, Roman Catholic apologists, uh, and even at times the uh, Protestant apologists who brought this forward to me. So what you have next is the idea that, well, uh, uh, well let's put it in, in Palamas' terms. He says to Barlaam, when you say that the spiration of the generation, the spiration of the spirit or the generation of the sun is in some sense uh, an eternal manifestation from the divine, 
uh, is that also the divine essence? Yes, they would say. Uh, right. So now is creation distinct from the divine essence? Yes, it is. Right. So now if generation, spiration, creation are all actions of the divine essence, how is there any distinction between creation and eternal generation? This is called the originist problematic. And this is, in fact, one of the reasons that Origen gave for why he believed that the sun ultimately was a creature. Why? Because Origen believed that divine simplicity meant that the father, fatherhood, right, is the same as the divine essence. Now, when you go and you read uh, St. Gregory of Nyssa, when he's debating with Eunomius, Eunomius says the exact same thing. Eunomius says, I know what it is to be the divine essence. What? what? The divine essence is to be ungenerate, he says. All right? It is the father. So fatherhood and the divine essence are, are defined as the same thing. And so therefore, Eunomius argued that if there's any distinction, then it has to, whatever's distinct has to be a created thing because it's not that divine essence. So the sun or the spirit or whatever ends up becoming a, a created thing, again, because of the presuppositions of divine simplicity in those different systems. So when we come to Roman Catholic theology, this is why St. Gregory Palamas explicitly says to Barleam, and this applies to the Augustinian or the Thomist, that your presuppositions of divine simplicity lead to Arianism. And it doesn't really matter how you concoct the system. It's all it's always going to be that, right? Again, I'm, it, this doesn't mean that it's your intention to be Arian. We're not debating your intentions. We're debating the specific teachings and philosophy, objective statements that are made. Now, multiple times in Denzinger, you have the explicit statement of divine simplicity. And it's absolute. And it's in the Augustinian and Thomistic sense. So there's no wiggle room here for the Roman Catholic apologists to try to say, oh, well, those are the opinions of Aquinas and Augustine, and they don't really constitute uh, uh, necessarily a Roman Catholic dogma. No, you have to follow all of what's in Denzinger. You can't question any of these doctrines in Denzinger because they are ordinary apostolic magisterium. And if you just look up in the and I have it all marked, but I'm not going to sit here and read through every one of these. If you're too lazy to look these up, then you don't even need to be debating it. Look up Divine Simplicity, and then look up all the sections in Denzinger where uh, it's explicitly affirmed in the Augustinian sense. You have the, the statements that Divine Simplicity means that all the actions of God are His essence, that the Divine Persons are the Divine Essence, etc., etc., etc. In strict identification, again, exactly what Augustine teaches in Book 7, uh, of on the Trinity and exactly what Aquinas teaches in volume one of the Summa. All right. So there's no rib wiggle room here as to what these things mean. Now, there's all these statements about the partaking of the divine nature or deification. Right. We're not disputing that, that Roman Catholic theologians have this idea or this this concept there, uh, and naturally they do because it's so obvious throughout the first millennia of patristic writings, especially in the East. So what we're debating, though, is whether or not you actually have a coherent presentation of that. And the argument, again, is that it all flows out of a misunderstanding of the starting point, right? First of all, we don't start with the starting point that God is generic being. God is not, when he says in Exodus 3, I am that I am, that is not a statement of being, generic being. That's a covenantal statement of personhood, divine personhood, right? So if you read Father Stan Eloy's volume one of Orthodox Dogmatics, you'll see that he makes this argument. And you'll see how different or contrasted that is to Etienne Gilson's argument in Spirit of Medieval Philosophy, where, where Gilson, when he treats of this in the Tome Mystic Scheme, he says, when God says, I am that I am, he's saying, I am super existent being. Right, so there's the, there's the, the Hellenic approach. Exodus 3 and Staniloi, uh, the Orthodox approach, no, it's not a statement of being, it's a statement of covenantal personhood. God is saying, I am a person that you can relate to and have a, a covenantal uh, interaction with. Uh, do some fathers talk about the possibility of that having philosophical connotations? Sure, we don't have a problem with that. 
But we do have a problem with that being a statement about God saying what his essence is. That's ridiculous. It has nothing to do with that. It's not a statement of super essence. Uh, existence even it's, itself is an energy of God. Existence is not the divine essence. Uh, again, all of those are statements of God as revealed to us. And those are real distinct things. The, 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 the love of God, the mercy of God is not the foreknowledge of God. The, the, if, if every act in God is the same as the divine essence, right? And if Jesus's miracles are manifestations of his, uh, of his divine power and divine nature, then Jesus walking on water is, is the same as the divine essence. The creating of the, of the world is the same as the divine essence. So what you get is emanationism here. See, this is all problematic and we reject all that. Now, another way to show this is Mount Tabor, the light that's manifested, right? Now, Roman Catholics know that Orthodox use this argument, but they don't understand why this is so important. And it goes back to what Augustine says in relationship to the Theophanies. Again, in, in Augustine's mind, in his divine simplicity view, it's not possible for there to be these theophanic manifestations that are really God. So he has to say they're created angelic forms. And that's what I just showed you. Just go rewind and look at the section in, on the Trinity where he says that. So when the question of the divine light, the divine glory, these different manifestations come up, right? This is the light that we partake of. This is the immortality that we partake of. They are the divine life itself. They're not the divine essence, but they're the uncreated divine life itself. Right. And that's the thing is that, you know, when, when Timothy says that God dwells in unapproachable glory and light and glory, he's using the same idea as Matthew 17, the transfiguration, right? The light that illumines Christ. That light is not created. If you say that it's created, that is a heresy, right? Because the whole point of that is to manifest the divine in time and space. So we all agree that the divine essence isn't manifested in time and space, but we also have to admit that the Bible says that people see God. Isaiah saw God, right? Jacob wrestled with God. Samson's parents, right? They met God. Joshua met the angel of the Lord, God, right? So those are all the logos. They're really manifestations of divine persons, theophanies, right? before the coming of an incarnation of the Messiah. Now, how is that possible? And again, you see that in, in Augustinian theology, it's not possible, right? Because you can't have an absolutely simple divine essence truly manifesting within time and space by the nature of what an absolutely simple essence is. That this is why the Eastern Fathers are so adamant at stressing that all of those theophanies are Christ. And they really are him present. Uh, and you have to admit that, right? Because all of this hangs and falls together. So the divine power and glory that we're going to participate in and share in, which is ultimately what makes us live forever, gives us immortality, uh, is not something created. It's not a hologram. It's not a temporary manifestation of a, uh, you know, angels wearing a Jesus suit. <laughs> it's an actual manifestation of divine power. Now, uh, Isaiah, for example, says that he saw God. Now, uh, the, the tradition, of course, is that Isaiah was sawn in two because there's no man who can see God and live. So the Bible's not contradicting itself when it says that saints and patriarchs saw God, right? And what Paul says is that we see Christ face to face we see, and we move as a result in this life, we move from glory to glory. Paul says glorification begins now. How is that possible if glorification is the beatific vision? You see, the beatific vision is then just another logical following through of all of this presupposition relating to divine simplicity. That's why Aquinas's resurrection doctrine has absolutely no, almost absolutely no place for the body. 
the beatific vision in the final state is conceived of as a kind of intellectual vision of the divine essence and the properties of all things in the divine essence. Now, there's a, a fascinating quote in St. Maximus, I think it's on the chapters on love, St. Maximus Confessor, where he says something similar, but he does not say that it is the divine essence that we're staring into. The eternal state, as both St. Gregory and Isai and St. Gregory and Maxima, uh, Saint Maximus Confessor and all the Eastern Saints have always said, is a participation in the many divine energies. And we will forever be moving up into God for all eternity, as St. Gregory Nyssa says about the eschaton, by the participation in these many energies. And God even has energies that he's not manifested to us in time and space. You know, how, how many are the works of the Lord? You can't name them. So, <clears throat> what I want to stress then now is that these many areas of clearly distinct doctrines and what I tried to stress in the last few few papers was that it's not just a matter of whether or not we can pinpoint that the Holy Spirit supposedly uh, dis, uh, proceeds from the will of God, which was obviously an Arian subordinationist argument. Uh, I want to, first of all, show that that is still true. That's abs I was absolutely right in that argument, and that's why it's had almost a thousand shares. And that argument alone is almost enough to con <laughs> convert a lot of people. I actually didn't know this, that the, <clears throat> this argument is also reproduced in the many writings of St. Gregory Palamas. So I was on the right track there. Uh, thank God for that. So let's look at this point. So to make this a little bit clearer in terms of St. Gregory, uh, you'll find that a lot of times Roman Catholic apologists or even Protestant apologists will try to find these similarities of, of statement. Uh, and so, oh, look, here's a similar statement in St. Gregory Palamas. Uh, so he taught the filioque. The irony is that, and the stupidity of this, is that it's in the context of the very sections, almost always, where he's rejecting the filioque. So you'll notice here that, uh, and this is from an excellent book by uh, Father uh, Manserides, Georgios Manserides, uh, and maybe he's not a priest, or maybe he's just a professor, but... Uh, he says that just as God is in three and in, in one, that is intellect, logos, and spirit, so man fashioned in his image does exhibit a kind of small trinity. We don't have a problem with that. I've been arguing that even with some Orthodox people at times. It reveals the reflection of the Trinitarian God within the man created in his image. Employing this psychological image is reminiscent of St. Augustine's teachings on the Trinity. Palamas presents the third person of the Holy Spirit as the boundless and timeless love of the Father for the Son, uh, manifested towards the Father. It is unnecessary to point out that the use of this image is not inconsistent with Palamas's anti-Latin teaching on the procession of the Holy Spirit. For through it, for although he proceeds from, uh, although he presents the third person of the Trinity as the mutual love of the Father and Son, he makes it clear that this muta mutuality refers to the function and possession, and not his existence uh, or projection, his existential projection. The eternal joy, this is quote, the eternal joy of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit since is the Holy Spirit since he is common to both with respect to his use. Hence, he is sent by both to the saints. But his existence, that is hypostatic origins, uh, derives solely from the Father, and hence where his existence is concerned, he proceeds from the Father. Thus, on the Trinitarian model, the Spirit fashioned in God's image is the intellectual love of the Father towards his intel uh, of his intellect towards his intelligence, etc., etc., so it's not a statement of hypostatic origin. Uh, in fact, I just had a Roman Catholic apologist, Eric Ibarra, bring this up. Uh, of course, I'm presently uh, not able to use Facebook for 30 days, so I'm going to respond here in this video. But uh, he made a similar statement that, well, you, you can't really say that it's problematic to say that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the will of the Father and the Son because uh, there's all kinds of statements about the 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 spirit being the love or the 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 son being the will of the father that's precisely gregory's point we make a distinction between hypostatic origin and economia so when saint gregory says it's fine to talk about the son sending the spirit if it's economia but it has nothing to do with the spirit's origin you can't read economia back into hypostatic origins and that's precisely the whole problem that the east has with 
Western Roman Catholic theology. And it doesn't matter that Roman Catholic theology says, well, we don't really give uh, 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 the principal place of uh, perce uh, the, the procession of the Spirit to the Son. We give it to the Father. It doesn't matter because the Son in no way participates in the existential uh, procession of the Spirit. The Son receives the Spirit, and that's why we have no problem saying through the Son, but he is not a co-creator of the Spirit, and in fact, Denzinger makes it very clear that the Son is a co-cause. He's not a co-cause of the hypostatic uh, origin of the person. That's why we have a problem with this. And once you make the Son a, a co-creator, uh, or excuse me, a, a co-producer uh, of the Spirit, that you have an, an imbalance in the Trinity, because then you have uh, a, a function that the Father and the Son uh, participate in that the Spirit does not participate in. In other words, so the Spirit is subordinated. One of the many problems here. Uh, but again, we want to stress that, yeah, it's if you say something like, you know, the, the, the Son is the will of the Father, that is in terms of manifestation or uh, God facing the world, right? That's not a statement about the that that the son is literally the same thing as the will of the father right and so in the same way you can't say the spirit is the love of god and literally believe that there's a, a that that the second person that the third person of the trinity is the same thing as uh, a divine action or operation there might be a sense in which he manifests the love of god uh, but he is not identically the same as one attribute of god uh, any more than saying that the Son is the reason of the Father, right? We wouldn't conclude from that that the Holy Spirit is not, therefore, reasonable, right? That would be bizarre and weird. Another testament to this fact, uh, which, again, proves what I've been trying to argue, and this is from the triune God, incomprehensible but knowable, the philosophical and theological significance of Gregory Palamas. And this is Professor, I'm not sure if I pronounce it right, Selengides, Greek, Greek guy at Thessaloniki. And he points out, God, furthermore, excuse me, furthermore, if divine grace is confused with the person of the Holy Spirit, as the Latins frequently do, then for Palamas, the saints are partakers of of the divine essence or grace and there become gods themselves equal to Christ, right? So uh, as many as Gregory Palamas argued with Barlaam, you can't say that that the uh, Holy Spirit is what we actually get in deification, right? So when, when Palamas poses these dilemmas to Barlaam, Barlaam at first talks about created grace and he says, oh no, well actually what you get is the person of the Holy Spirit. No, you don't get, you're not melded with the person of the Holy Spirit. And that's what uh, Palamas is saying here. The grace that's given here is not the same as the hypostasis of the Spirit. And this is why, partly why we make these distinctions. He says, because they unite in their, if they unite in their hypostasis with the Holy Spirit, then they would be falling into the heresy of uh, Barlaam. But such is an inevitable conclusion through the arguments of Roman Catholic theology, the Latins, which distorts ontologically both the theology and the th anthropology of the church. This is why Palamas insists that only with the clear and real distinction between essence and energy in God can there be an existential procession of the Holy Spirit from the Father and a procession in terms of appearance and energies to the Son. This distinction is also allows for the correct, correct interpretation of the New Testament according to which the faithful can become partakers of the divine nature. But since Roman Catholic theology confuses the hypostatic with the natural properties of God, according to Palamas, they confuse the mission of the Holy Spirit with his procession. Exactly. This is what I've been trying to argue. And this is really, in essence, what my uh, filioquism is, Arian subordinationism applied to the spirit argument is trying to argue. In this way, Roman Catholic uh, Roman Catholics confuse procession with the goodwill and the will of God. But this is a confused doctrine regarding the existence of the triune God because in this way the Holy Spirit becomes part of creation. According to the fathers, God created through his will 
If So if God separates his will from the Holy Spirit, this in turn makes the Spirit a part of creation. It is on this issue that Palamas claims that Roman Catholics come close to Arianism. Exactly. That's why the Holy Spirit cannot be said to proceed from will. It is on this issue that, Pal and, and by the way, uh, when Eric Ybarra replied on this point, he says, well, there's statements in Denzinger's that say that the Holy Spirit is the will of God, so there's no problem. The problem is confusion, right? Again, that is I incoherent because you can't, the Holy Spirit does not proceed from will and also be the will. That would mean that he proceeds from himself, which is ridiculous. And this is because you're all confused. So, <clears throat> it is on this issue that Palamas claims that Roman Catholics come close to Arianism. Uh, Arianism claimed that the Son came into existence by the will of the Father. And so, the Latins believe that the Spirit is proceed, proceeds from the will of the Father and the Son. <laughs> and this is because Roman Catholics confused the procession of the Holy Spirit with his mission and with the will and good will of God. Yep, this is what I argued and... Thank God, what do you know, Gregory Palamas made my argument hundreds of years ago. So, to summarize, if you really want to get clear on this, uh, I recommend the book Deification of Man, St. Gregory Palamas, The Orthodox Tradition by Gregorios Manserides. And you also need to read Father Stan Eloy's Orthodox Dogmatic Theology. Both of these are neo-Palamite. In other words, they're just orthodox, right? We're not uh, trying to blend our view with the heresies of the West. Uh, if you read those works, you'll be a lot clearer on exactly what we're saying here. And really, once you start to get down the Eastern view uh, of the monarchy of the Father, right? The Father as the Arche, and that that alone is what he is. And then you realize that the Son is eternally generated and that the Holy Spirit eternally proceeds, right, from a single source, right? Once you start to realize that how important that is, then you realize that this doctrine is balanced because that, our distinctions make clear hypostasis from energies. And in the Roman Catholic tradition, you have so much confusion of persons and energies and person and essence that it's all a big jumbled mess and by the way the last chapter in this book is a great ex exposition and critique of where modern roman catholic theology has gone with this madness so all of you roman catholics who are out there trying to debate this uh you know medieval stuff you're not even like in the game when it comes to the Vatican II radicals and where they've really taken things. I mean, they don't even believe in any of this stuff, really. It's, they've actually gone into like the total perennialism, you know, generic theism. You know, we can meld with Islam now. So uh, the 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 orth, so-called Orthodox that are that are rabid about trying to uh, meld these two views, which do not meld at all because one of them is heresy, uh, you're, you're actually just making fools of yourself and you're going to go down the route of perennialism. And I remember a long time ago, I heard this criticism of, of, the, of how Roman Catholicism really ends in perennialism and I, and I didn't understand. I didn't get it until I read the entire first book of the Summa Contra Gentiles also 10 years ago. And then I realized that what Thomas is teaching is perennialism. Now, he's not intentionally doing that, but he's saying, yes, uh, what the Muslim apologist is arguing for is the same as what the Christian apologist is, because we all believe in one God, right? No. When we say one God, we're not talking about uh, some super essence, some common notion of existence. And this is the, what the, all of the analogia entis is based on. We are not saying that. That's why we reject analogia entis. We do believe in an analogy, which can be used in terms of the divine energies. Uh, that's stated by St. John Damascus. That's stated by St. Gregory, or St. Uh, uh, Maximus the Confessor. Uh, many times, I, you can read about that in my critique essay of Romanides. Father Florovsky says this in his essay, Creation and Creaturehood, which is good to read. Um, but we are not in common cause with 
the arguments for a generic theism. There is no generic theism. This is why the theophanies are so important. The Old Testament saints uh, were not worshipers of a generic theism. Right? That's masonry. We reject Freemasonry. And all of you idiot Orthodox apologists out there who don't even know what Freemasonry teaches and don't know the history of Roman Catholicism and uh, Freemasonry for the past 300 years, you ought to go read the Roman Catholic papal encyclicals against Freemasonry from the last 300 years. And then you might learn that what I'm talking about when it comes to uh, Masonic issues in the church are not crazy conspiracy theories. I actually know what I'm talking about. But you don't, by the way. And that's why none of you will actually do a public debate with me because you know you'll lose. So I, I open the challenge here, Eric Ibarra or any of these characters, if, if you want to come on and do a real formal public debate, uh, everybody knows that I do that. I did one with Adam Kokesh uh, on atheism. Come on and do it. Uh, what are you scared of?